Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, welcome back to another lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. This is the 15th lecture of this series uh, uh, for Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. And today we will be moving forward from the variogram, uh, you know, theoretical variogram and experimental variogram and a variogram model where we really had this, uh, you know, we got to a point where we have a genetic device to which if I provide a spatial lag measure or spatial distance between any two points, that is h, it provides me a measure of spatial contiguity between those two points, right? So today we are going to move one step forward and look at an example, start with an example where our basic aim is to predict unknown values in space, right? So, so we have been building up to this point uh, 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 to be able to really predict one of the objectives is to predict unknown uh, you know or unsampled locations in space and then from there we will go on to the uh, you know next module which is uh, spatial regression wherein we will take this leap from uh, you know uh, correlation to causation as well right okay so let's move forward so i have this slide titled as spatial dependence estimation and prediction for a non-stationary domain. Like I said, we are going to work with an example, but in this example, we are going to, uh, you know, assume that we are starting with a non-stationary domain. So, you know, we are working with a real world problem. It's not going to be a textbook, uh, you know, representation. It's going to have issues of its own. So, you know, as an analyst, how do we go about tackling these issues systematically, eventually getting to a point where we are using a variogram model to be able to provide a spatial prediction. Okay, so we will start with an example and then finally uh, towards the, uh, you know, uh, 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 after this lecture, after lecture 15, you will have uh, learned also the theory of a, a you know, theory of uh, spatial interpolation or basically spatial prediction. Okay, so we have to start with a non-stationary domain. Um, I'm going to begin with an example. I'm going to begin with an example for groundwater levels uh, data in one dimension, right? So one dimension means it's really the re real number line. So basically we are based, we are walking on a real number line and at different locations we are measuring the groundwater depth, okay? So let's draw that representation here. So we have a ground surface. On this ground surface, I have locations S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, and S6. Okay, at each location, I have a realization that is Z of S1 equals 2, so 2 meters depth, right? Z of S2 equals 5, Z of S3 equals 12, Z of S4 equals 8, Z of S5 equals 15, and Z of S6, uh, S6 equals 20, okay? Now, uh, even before we do anything, uh, you know, we, we start working with these data, it's pretty clear that as I'm moving along the real number line, from location one to location six, the depth of groundwater level is on average rising, right? There we, we sort of sense a rise in these, in these values for this particular example, right? And this x-axis, I'm just gonna say x-axis is my ground level, right? This is my 
uh, way of uh, sort of, you know, this is where I go in, dig a well and figure out the value of, uh, you know, well uh, depth. And, uh, you know, Z of S1, so Z by itself represents groundwater depth. Okay, just for completeness. So we're going to draw these data on a graph. So we have, let's say, groundwater depth on the y axis and on the x axis, I have my, you know, locations. So I have my S1, I have my S2, S3, S4, S5, S6 and S7. So I, I don't have S7, so I'm going to stop at S6. And let's say on on the y axis, I mark levels 5. So this is 5 is basically groundwater depth. So on the y axis, I have groundwater depth, let's say it is in meters, and x is also in meters. So as I'm moving from S1 to S2, the distance between them will be given in meters, okay. Okay. And uh, let's say 5, 10, um, 15, 20, and 25, okay. So at S1, I know that at S1, the value of observed value is 2. So it's somewhere around here. At S2, the value is 5. So it is somewhere here. Uh, I'm just going to mark them, uh, uh, you know, slightly with, uh, you know, with some approximation. But I'll, I'll try my I'll trial doing my you know, best of my ability, mark them to scale. Okay, so Z is four, five, and six, that is 20. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so, so as I saw, when I looked at the numbers, I felt that as if I, when I'm moving from S1 till S through S6, you know, the groundwater depth is sort of rising. So the groundwater situation is becoming worse and worse as we traverse from S1 to S6, right? When I plot this data, I'm actually able to, you know, work out a trend between these values, okay? So, so I, if I were to, you know, try and, you know, plot this, I'm going to have something of this. So this is the spatial trend in groundwater data. And this is not this this figure although is in space shouldn't surprise you. Imagine the groundwater data were some kind of a time series. Let's say it was GDP and S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6 were time points. So then you know I'm really looking at a time trend. So trend is not something that is very new to us when we, uh, as, as statisticians or econometricians, right? Uh, but to be able to look at a spatial trend and to plot it, that is perhaps, uh, you know, quite new, okay? So let's see what this trend effect really does. So if I look at these values, I mean, I, I should be able to also figure out what is, you know, uh, that uh, G bar, that is the mean value of groundwater depth for these data is 2 plus 5 plus 12 plus 8, plus 15, plus 20, uh, divided by 6. Um, I believe if you, uh, if you sum them, it will be 52 by 6, so it will be somewhere around 9 meters, okay? So this is something, you know, we are used to, you know, uh, 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 we, we are used to starting with some kind of a summary of these data. I've just pointed out that the mean groundwater depth in the domain that I'm studying. So my domain of interest is S1 through S six, right? So my domain of interest D comprises of locations. Well, we can say locations, uh, you know, S1 through S6. Okay. Even though S1 through S6 are discrete points, every point between them is a potential for observing groundwater levels. And the locations where we do not get to measure, uh, you know, sample these data, well, those are the locations where we uh, should be able to predict these data. So, so the aim of this exercise really is to be able to say, 
take a point between S3 and S4, call it as zero, and we want to, you know, our aim here is uh, to estimate, to estimate or predict the value of groundwater depth at location S0, right? This is what we were after. This is a prediction exercise. S0 again is a representative unknown or unsampled location. Every other location that remains unsampled is a, uh, you know, uh, 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 is a uh, candidate for, for, for prediction, right? So what do we do? Well, as uh, step one, you know, what we will do is we will model spatial dependence in data, in the data using the given sample, right? Right. So when I say data, I basically mean the data that is given to us, the data set that has been given to us. Why do we do that? Well, if we are able to, if we are able to predict spatial dependence, right? Remember, I'm not, I am looking for a point S0 where there is no observation. I want to know where would S0, you know, the value of groundwater level or depth of groundwater level, what will it be at S0? What has been happening before S0 is that there is a rising trend from 2 till, uh, till, till, till 12. So it's a very quick rise. But as soon as I come to S4, it seems like there is a drop. So this is pretty confusing as a statistician. You know, if they kept rising, I could have said, you know, maybe these values, uh, the value is between, you know, uh, uh, 12 and the next higher value, right? But what happens is that S4, it comes down, uh, GW comes down, and at S5, it again goes up drastically, right? So I don't really know, you know, it's, it's really hard, it's non-trivial to predict what should be groundwater depth at uh, the location S zero. Now we want to model spatial dependence so that we'll be able to know what is the strength of dependence around S3 and around S4. If the spatial dependence is very strong around S3 and not so strong around S4, then S0 will be nearer to S3 in terms of its representation of groundwater depth. If it's vice versa, it might be that you have, a, you know, a greater spillover coming from S4 than from S3. Right? Clearly, S0 is closer to S3 and slightly farther away from S4. So that will also be accounted for. So there is closeness and there is also this spatial dependence, the strength of spatial dependence at those two locations. That is what is going to be, you know, uh, 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 revealed by the variogram. So, so we will use a variogram and, and more specifically a variogram model, right? Apart from that, I would say clearly, clearly, the knowledge of this trend, the trend, the knowledge of this trend of spatial trend um, in the x direction, in the positive x direction, uh, will help or helps or aids prediction, right? Help in predicting groundwater level at a zero, right? However, this very trend will make our data non-stationary, right? So, however, the trend effect makes our data non-stationary. We will just look in a minute how trend makes our data non-stationary. Now, having this trend effect, this kind of this, this kind of structure in the data, which is coming in as trends, it could be a non-linear trend as well, right? Other than that, you might have regimes, right? It might be, it might be that S1 through S3 is data in regime A and S4 through S5, S6, you have a data set in regime B, right? Whichever way this structure arises, right, through a continuous trend or a piecewise, you know, uh, uh, average or piecewise linear, uh, you know, uh, representation, this structure provides me some knowledge that I can use to then predict the S0 value, right? But 
On the other hand, this makes my data non-stationary, which means all my definitions of G-bar, my definition of G-bar, my definition of radiogram, uh, they are all useless. So basically the radiogram is not defined because the radiogram requires intrinsic non-stationality to hold for us to be able to write that, uh, you know, uh, second moment property of spatial data. Okay, so there is a pro and there is a con of spatial non-stationarity in data and this sort of, you know, provides a trade-off due to data structures. Uh, structural breaks, structural breaks or patterns in data. Okay, just a remark uh, so that it sort of, uh, you know, uh, stays with us. Okay, so with this, now that we have an understanding of this trend, let's go ahead and try, uh, try to sort of model this trend. Okay, so say, say, we model the spatial trend. And when I say that, what I really mean is that you have groundwater level at location SI. I'm writing that as beta zero plus beta one I. So I is the index for space. When I move from S1 to S2, this movement from one to two tells me that S2 is located in the positive X direction from S1 and similarly then S3, S4, S5. So as the index i increases, I'm moving along the x-axis. So this is a convenient, uh, you know, uh, specification that the data uh, structure allows me. And then I have a random error. So this is called as a linear trend regression. Again, those of you who have seen time series analysis must have been definitely aware of this. This is a simple linear regression model. So we are introducing a regression model. We are modeling the variation in G of SI, which is a spatial, uh, you know, variable. On the left hand side, we have a linear model of what I want to explain, right? So my dependent variable that is groundwater depth at location SI, which has a systemic, you know, portion of variation. So systemic portion or component of groundwater evolution in space, right? How the how groundwater levels evolve in space, you know, uh, is, is given by this systemic portion. This clearly exhibits, this clearly exhibits, uh, you know, uh, spatial trend in data. Right. The parameters beta 0 and beta 1 are called as model parameters, right? So beta 0 and beta 1 are model parameters. Okay. Beta 0 is an intercept, which is really a representation of, you know, global mean, a representation of mean values. Beta 1 is the change, the marginal change on moving to one step from, you know, lower x value to a higher x, x value, right? So it is a step change in groundwater depth upon moving from location i to location i plus 1, right? So the change bit in GSI between location i and location i plus 1 will be definitely driven by this systemic portion beta 0. Ui on the other hand is called as the random error. This is the variation in groundwater levels that is not explained by the trend, which is not surprising. You see, the trend, uh, you know, is, is one way of of, of learning about what's happening with groundwater levels in space. There are so many complex, you know, uh, 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 mechanisms or processes in place that really deliver the groundwater level that we see. Well, there is draft, you know, there is e extraction of water at different locations. There is, uh, you know, a, 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 a recharge in different locations. 
there are anthropogenic impacts there is rainfall whether you know rainfall is the same in at all locations s1 through s6 or you have some higher level rainfall regions and some lower level all these factors that can explain groundwater level which are different from a mean and the trend effect which we have included in our in our systemic portion will all go into the random error you know ui it's called an error because this is the error of our model. The model is beta 0 plus beta 1 i, right? And, and, and this error is one where we assume that at on expectation, this error will be 0, okay? So very quickly, if you want to see, if you want to go back to the previous slide where we drew this data, well, you know, this uh, trend line has an intercept and it has a, you know, uh, uh, a slope. A slope is the step increase in moving from i to i plus 1. So this is beta 1 representation, right, on your screen. And you see that, you know, the predicted value at, at S6 from this model will be beta 0 plus beta 1, you know, times 6. It will be a value on the yellow line. Now, this predicted value, which is in black, and the truth, which was the actual value, observed value, which is in blue, are different, right? This difference represents the error from our model, okay? This is the error in the regression, linear trend regression on, uh, you know, on the previous slide, okay? So, so let's move forward. Okay, so now I have my, you know, understanding of this, of this uh, model through a spatial regression. Why is it spatial regression? Because it is explicitly exploiting, you know, space in order to specify the random variable that is a groundwater depth in a given region or domain D, right? Now, straight away, you will see that if I were to write the expectation, you know, expectation of G of SI, it will be expectation of beta zero, which is a constant, which is just beta zero. So, expectation of a constant is the constant itself plus uh, you know, beta 1, which is again a constant and i is deterministic. So, location is not random. i is, when I say location is a 6, I mean it is exactly a 6, not like it is S6 plus minus somewhere. There is no such measurement error or any kind of error in location i. So, my expectation at, you know, uh, of GSI is just beta 0 plus beta 1 i because the expectation of ui is 0. Similarly, if I were to go to a separate location as j, here the expectation will be beta 0 plus beta 1 j. This implies that the expectation of g of si will be not unequal or not equal to expectation of g of sj. For all i j pairs such that i is not equal to j. So that means the expectation, the first moment, that is the mean at different locations is different due to the trend effect, specifically due to the trend effect, right? This is where the station non-stationarity is coming from, right? This is the definition, the first condition of uh, stationarity, be it intrinsic or second order stationarity is that the mean is the same at all locations. Well, that is not the case here. So that's why trend leads to non-stationarity. So let's move on from the first moment characterization that leads to the reason for non-stationarity to the second moment characterization that is the variance of G of SI. Now the purpose of a regression model is to be ultimately be able to explain the variation of the dependent variable. So ultimately as an analyst when I'm specifying a regression model I'm trying to explain the variation in groundwater levels, right? So, so if I go back, you know, if I look at the raw data, there is this variation in groundwater levels that is happening. Of course, there is a trend effect, right? That's why I include it into my model. But ultimately, I want to be able to do my best in order to explain this variation in, in, in groundwater levels, which are going up and down through space, right? Now, uh, so second moment characterization is about, you know, uh, 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 what is the total variation in the data? The total variation in the data will come from the second moment that is the variance of G of SI. 
Now, part of this variation will be explained by the trend, right? The trend characterization that is a systemic portion as, as, as we have specified here, but the part that is not explained will go into the residual. So we, so we characterize or we sort of uh, represent variance of GSI as sigma squared, uh, you know, T, which tells me the trend component plus sigma squared u, right? So, 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 you know, the trends are explaining some variation in the data and the rest is remaining unobserved, okay? So, <clears throat> this is just to sort of get an understanding of the regression model. So, now, say we estimate, we estimate beta 0 and beta 1 from the given data data set using what is called as the ordinary least squares method okay that is the ols now if you have not heard of ols don't worry about it we are going to move to spatial regression in the next lecture and we're going to introduce what ols is and what a regression is and then we'll adapt it to the space uh, dimension spatial dimension and then move from there to the causal inference idea, <clears throat> okay? So say we estimate beta 0 and beta 1 from the given data set using the ordinary least squares. So the idea is that I have this true parameter beta 0 and beta 1, which were really a, you know, a, a representation of what I should be expecting. Now I have estimated them, I call them beta 0 hat OLS and beta 1 hat OLS. This beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat OLS is nothing but values that I, I, I'm able to reduce from the given data set, right? Beta zero hat will be the intercept where it touches the line, right? Touches the, 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 the y axis, the, the regression line and the slope at which it is rising, that slope is beta one hat, right? So it will be an actual numerical value, right? So <clears throat> once we get our beta zero hat and beta one hat, we are able to construct a mean and trend filter for our ground water data. What does that mean? Well, once I have my beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat, I can put that back into the regression model. That is to say G of SI minus beta 0 hat minus beta 1 hat I. Remember, this value is nothing but the residual that is remaining than when we remove both the beta 0 and beta 1 i effect. So we have the ui left because we have now included real actual numbers as beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat and they've come from the data. Well, this value is nothing but u hat i, <coughs> right? I, and when I say u hat i, basically it means residual at location i. So I could have actually written this as u hat s i. Or I could then also write this as g star s i, where g star s i is the d mean and d trended ground water uh, level, you know, variable. What does it mean when I say that I'm removing the mean and I'm removing the trend? Like I said, beta zero is a representation of the mean value of groundwater level, that is expectation of groundwater level uh, when i is zero, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and beta one is the, is the trend effect, right? Uh, right um, now the point is that when I estimate these things from the data and deduct these from data what I'm doing is that I'm first you know I am removing the mean removing the mean groundwater level and here I'm removing the trend in groundwater levels 
okay what does that what does that mean let's figure it out going back to our graphical representation so we'll do it on the next slide so let's say i have my data again you know let's uh, uh, rem just remind ourselves a really quickly that i was working with data at locations s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 and s6 uh, and the groundwater levels at these locations were 2, 2 meters, 5 meters, 12 meters, 8 meters, 15 meters and 20 meters. So my original plot looked something like as under, okay. Let's plot this. I have my locations S1, um, S2, S3, S5 and S6 and on the x-axis I have 5, 10, 15 and 20 and 25. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and do as good a job as possible to, to plot this, to, to create this, construct this plot to scale. Okay. All right, we have S5 is where we hit the groundwater is at 15 meters and S6 where the groundwater is at 20 meters. So this is the true data set. And we had drawn the trend effect here, uh, you know, earlier, again, uh, trying to sort of uh, keep the representation about the same, if not exactly the same. Um, Okay, so this is my trend effect. This is my original plot. I'm just going to call this my original plot. Okay, now let's sort of plot, draw the detrended and demean plot, right? So now I'm going to draw what I'm going to call as the uh, filtered, so you know, uh, you know, filtered groundwater plot. That means when I say filtered, I mean demeaned and detrended groundwater levels. Okay, so let me draw that. Try and uh, be as accurate as possible so that you can actually compare these two plots. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, and S6. On the x-axis, I have my 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Now, after I demean my data, where is my data going to be, you know, uh, 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 mean that, right? So first of all, I have detrended the data. So I have my trend like this. When I detrend it, it becomes flat. And when I when it becomes flat, at around the value of nine, that is the G bar, that is the that is the average groundwater, you know, uh, depth. That is G bar equals nine. I'm going to have my data, you know, centered at this at this mean. But what I've also done is that I have demeaned my data. That is to say that my mean value will now slide to zero. Right, so because I've taken out the mean, I've taken out the trend. So first I've taken the trend, I've flattened it, right? And then I've taken it from nine to zero. So I'm going to try and draw my resulting data set like that. So in order to do that, I'm going to remove, I'm going to just shift the axis a little bit on the Y axis such that it is convenient for me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw zero slightly upward just for my convenience. This is just a convenient plot. So I have my mean that has now moved to the point which is zero on the y-axis. Okay. And if you look at the values that they will be after demeaning and detrending will be something as follows. So it will be uh, somewhere here, um, uh, uh, slightly above that at S2. At S3, it is a little bit more. S4 drops down, right? This is 
S4. S5, again, it is slightly below the, and then S6 is slightly above. Okay, so now I have my values centered around the mean. So the mean is what is giving me your UI hat. So what instead of, you know, GSI, which is on the left hand side plot, I am plotting G star SI, which is the D mean and D trended value. Okay, remember G star SI is beta, uh, sorry, GSI. GSI minus beta 0 hat minus beta 1 hat i. Okay. Now, when I plot a variogram, when I estimate a variogram, right, variogram estimation, what will it do? It will provide me a spatial dependence structure for this entire data set. Provides a spatial dependence structure or strength at each observed each observed value what that means is that you know when i observe uh, you know uh, at s3 when i observe this blue dot what's going to happen around s3 is that the values will look similar but as i move away from s3 those values will start to look less and less similar to S3 and more and more similar to the mean, the global mean, right? Because if I, if I get too far away beyond the range, then I have no predictive value coming from, you know, the, the observed value at S3. So what happens is that when, as I move on the right of S3, I have values which are similar to S3, but as I move forward, these, this spatial dependence goes away and it starts to converge with you know, the point which is the no correlation point, no spatial correlation, that is beyond the range that is estimated from the variogram, right? So after the range, these values are going to be equal to the mean because there is nothing to learn from the neighborhood. As I move closer to S4, well, there will be again something to learn and these values will start to look similar to S4. Similar, similarly, as I keep moving forward, the data that I have will start to look as shown on your screen, right? This is how the spatially dependent data are going to sort of, you know, uh, we are going to be able to predict a value as zero away from the sample location in our data. Okay, so if as zero was somewhere here, let's say it was closer to S3 and farther away from S4, then the S0 at S0 location, the cross will give me the D mean and D trended value. Now, in order to actually retrieve the actual value, I will have to add the trend back to these data, right? So I need actual GSI. Right now I have G star S0, right? So I have G star S0, I want G of S0. So I'm going to go and back and add this component which I had removed from the data. Okay, so the, as a next step, I'm going to say add trend. So we had detrended, then because detrended data is stationary, we estimate our variogram, our, we get our G star SI, and then we, uh, you know, add the trend back to the data. Okay, add trend back to data, okay? So if I do that, I'm going to use a different color. Here I have again S1, S2, uh, S3, S4, S5, and S6. So what I'm doing now is I'm adding the trend back to the data. So I have my trend line here like this. I'm going to have to just, you know, add the trend as well as the mean to the data. So the data will look like the following. So I have my trend added back to the data. Let's say this is the trend added back to the data. Then, you know, I have my representation will sort of change to the following.
okay so i'm just drawing these things to you know not to scale really but you know just to give you an idea of how these things look like would look like if you were to work with a real world problem like this okay so if you were to conduct this prediction then you can go between s0 and s s s3 and s4 let's say to s0 and now your you know you will have your unknown gs0 estimated from these data now let's say we did not conduct this detrending effect let, let's say we did not do that right what will happen then you know we will work with a d mean data set of course you know data the data are going to be you know centered around this g0 when they are predicted what's going to happen is that the variogram representation will look like the following so i'm going to use the the the, the green ink for that now this green ink is representing the scenario when i did not demean or detrain my data okay so i hope this lecture was uh, you know was fun for you and i look forward to having you in the next module which is called as spatial econometrics thank you mm -hmm.